Hello, welcome to The Ticket. I'm Tracy Holmes. With innovations like the Anzac Day clash and Dreamtime at the G, Kevin Sheedy is known for so much more than being an AFL player and one of the greatest coaches of his generation. He is a legend of the game. Sheedy played 251 games for Richmond and as a coach he led Essendon to four premierships over a remarkable 27 years. He was also the inaugural coach of the Giants in Greater Western Sydney. But his legacy goes beyond the field. He has a mind that has always adventured outside the box. And in doing so, he's helped broaden Australia's sporting landscape, while at the same time stamping sports place in a broader arena. Something sport is only about a contest to find a winner and a loser, when the real story of sport is the story of people, what motivates them, what drives them, their psychology and their spirit. An inspiration to many, Kevin Sheedy has sat down and documented other Australian sporting icons that have inspired him. Kevin Sheedy, welcome to The Ticket. Great to be on the show and, um, and have a ticket. Yeah. <laughs> now, look, from Olympic legends like uh, Dawn Fraser, the swimming legend, through to the America's Cup winning sailor John Bertrand, and then, of course, more contemporary athletes like Michelle Payne, the jockey, and tennis player Ash Barty, you've come up with a list that is limited to 28 Australian icons. How on earth did you cull it to such a small number? Well, I tried to meet most generations. Basically from when I was 10, I couldn't put Bradman in obviously. So uh, to me, they are people that have inspired me. So they're not the best by any stretch of the imagination, but they're damn good. And most likely many of them are the best. But they left the message and a trail for me to admire and adhere and learn from. And the book's all about learning from other people. So I always believe that great leaders chase knowledge and then go and share it. And I, I have learned a hell of a lot off these people, um, even if it's just the smallest sort of paragraph in my life that I've lived by. Um, it's just uh, incredible, you know, really. And I thought I'd pick these people out because for many different reasons. Um, I mean, like when you look at Debbie Flintoff, she, she never won the race till the last step. Well, you never, never, ever, ever, ever give up. So that's what it takes me to learn from that young lady. So, um, and of course, Bertram to go over and and, um, and beat America on their home turf and be down 3-1. Well, that, that is just a superstar win for our nation. And this enlightens people. And of course, with COVID the last couple of years, racing the way on the, around the world um, and many deaths, we, people need to be, you know, lifted and... That's what I've tried to do here. You mentioned John Bertrand there and the America's Cup. And, of course, back in 1983, this is the longest continuing sporting contest of all time. It began in, what, the 1850s. And no-one Correct. had won it except for the USA. And then Australia, too, rocks up. And we remember the time, the Prime Minister at the time, uh, Bob Hawke, saying that if any boss <laughs> sacked an employee for not turning up on that day, then he was a bum. So these sports stories tell us more than about the sporting occasion, don't they? They also tell us about where Australia is at that time. It's our history that is much broader than the sporting arena. Well, most people 40 years of age, Tracy, won't know John Bertram. And that's what happened and the reason why I wrote the book, because I was having a discussion at a conference and many of the younger people that were in IT uh, didn't know what had John Bertram had ever done. And, I mean, 40 is very young. Uh, 20 have no idea, and obviously, you know. So the balance was to basically start who really was inspirational for me, and that's Betty Cuppet and Dawn Fraser and Herb Elliott, these sorts of people, and then move it into decade by decade so I can actually get everybody in each of those decades as they go from 20 years of age, maybe Ash Barty and maybe a, a fantastic courage of Jessica Watson to sail around the world at, um, at, at 16 years of age, nearly get killed on the first way out uh, of the um, of Sydney Harbour and then has to come back, reconstruct the boat again with some very good friends and then come back and her interview is sensational, absolutely magnificent. You know, 
I'm speaking to you in a week in which um, Madison de Rosario has just won the New York Marathon, wheelchair athlete, off the back of winning gold at the Paralympic Games. Her coach is one of the most mm. phenomenal wheelchair athletes on the planet, Louise Sauvage. We've seen sport go through so many different cycles, haven't we? And, and other people come to the fore in a way that probably wasn't the case when you were a kid. When you see people like Louis Savage, who's actually in the book, which is in incredible, that, you know, the inspiration and the character of our Australian people, I mean, we love to hear the term the spirit of Australia. We hear it in our songs, we hear it in our national anthem, but what actually is it? What actually is it? And to me, I try to pick the right people. It's like a menu, and you, you like to put them into a book for, you know, young people to read, even older people at my, my age in the 70s, to go back and, and the memory tickles your, your life of, wow, I remember that time. And, um, you know, for Ash Barty to turn tennis around in this country, a, a young girl from uh, Ipswich, I put a map in there of everywhere, wherever they come from. I mean, you know, how many times did Cadell Evans really go to France to try and win, you know, the Tour de France and... You know, the guy's born in Catherine. <laughs> what an amazing story. <laughs> you talk about that Aussie spirit, and I know it's something that you've spent a lot of time thinking about, and it's something that you've tried to uh, apply and foster in your own coaching, in your own sport mm. of Aussie rules football. But what does it mean? Where, where do you see it? And, and what does it say to the rest of the world about Australia? We're sort of a, a very conservative country, but we like to protect our, our country from many different areas. And, and I think that, um, you know, when you look back and some of the great politicians we've had, we haven't had many great ones of late, I don't think. Uh, I think our leaders in business have been fantastic. And I think in the end, uh, our sports era and area uh, have been brilliant for a, probably a country that's not much more than a half of California's population one state of the United States of America. You talk Riddle. about leadership. Is there more that our national leaders and our leaders of business can learn from our sports leaders? Well, I, I think that, well, we can learn from everybody. You know, there's no doubt about that. Um, and I think that's probably the best way that I could look at my own life. I mean, I just found so many wonderful people in Australia obviously had to go overseas and buy knowledge, lots of books, lots of videos in the, in the 70s and 80s, come back and apply myself to a, a career that no one was doing full-time. And that was, you know, a, a first ever to be a full-time coach in, in AFL history. But the only way I could do that is to, to go and chase all that time away from your family and you know, your wife looking after your kids for six weeks at a time after football seasons and and then come back and, and just hope you get it right, you know, and, and try and inspire other people in and around your own, you know, um, life. And um, hopefully we've been able to do that. I know Tom Hafey was fantastic for me. Uh, many people in AFL have been wonderful. Many people in other sports, uh, the Australian Sports Hall of Fame, uh, Bakley, the chairman, um, John Bertram, and many of those incredible legendary champions I meet nearly every year. Uh, it's just fantastic for me and I, I consider myself still young although I'm probably cheating that a bit but the deal in the end is I love meeting all my heroes and I love writing about them and what they meant to me and you know one classic case was Bart Cummings Tracy and I asked him what what was his greatest ever skill once and he said well it's something a lot of people wouldn't know and I was all ears obviously and I thought to myself well what is it and he said observation now, I would never have thought that was going to be the answer. And I said, well, why do you think you need that? And he said, because the horse can't talk. Incredible answer. Incredible answer. What's your greatest skill, do you think? Uh, my attitude is pretty good. I've got a good, healthy attitude. I reckon that's kept me vibrant. Uh, probably chasing still what I want to have in my life before I'm not here I'm in the last quarter of my life obviously and I want to see more of the world and more of my own country and and try and do more good things around our country because and I can do that now I've got an opportunity now because uh, there's a trust issue 
uh, with Australians and if they like you and, and they, they think that they can trust your opinion, then um, you've got a chance. You have a chance. And, um, <clears throat> you know, Anzac Day and Dreamtime and these sorts of days and the AFL Sports Ready Traineeship and the Country Festival game that Essendon play against Geelong, I mean, that's, a, that's the biggest sponsor game in AFL history the country festival game against Geelong. And that, that just got trimmed with a, a pair of second tiers uh, by COVID. But this game's going to be absolutely one of the great ideas that we've worked on in the AFL. We're renowned for our sporting talent. Uh, but by the same token, we're also one of the oldest living cultures. We have one of the oldest living cultures on the globe right here with our Indigenous absolutely. community. And so I wonder what you think about how we've pulled that together, what sort of a role sport has played in that and how much more of a role sport can continue to play as we still kind of wrestle with some of these ideas. We still talk about racism. We talk about whether athletes should take a knee. These are, these are big global issues, but of course they're also very prominent here in Australia. Yeah. Well, look, I think one of the great... Um probably things that have happened in my lifetime was uh, uh, Obama being president of America. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, it was great to see an Afro-American uh, young person become the president of the United States. I thought that was, you know, a great decision and, uh, and probably a caring person in that area. Um, to see him go to study, to become and put himself in a position where he could be uh, President of America, a uh, monster tick. And I think in the end, um, our own Indigenous people uh, probably, I think, that uh, really need to lift as well um, to say, I can. I can do and uh, make my life greater than where, where I am at the present time. Sport has given that platform. There's no doubt about that. I have Lionel Rose in the book and, um, you know, I used to hear that many criticisms about dedicate or lack of dedication, uh, can't handle the pressure Indigenous people, don't know whether they can really play on the big day on the MCG. Well, for, for the head of population, they've, they've done pretty well with the Norm Smith medal. And you've got Lionel Rose leaving a little country town around Druin and Warrigal and gets on a plane in, in, in you know, like the 60s and goes over and, and uh, wins the world title in Tokyo against fighting Harada. Now, that was a monster decision to say to me personally, one day I'm going to actually get into recruiting these Indigenous boys and uh, if I ever get a coaching job and when I do, um, once I set that coaching job up where people will believe that this is the right way to go, uh, then I'm going to do something about it. And uh, Essendon did. Essendon did uh, and Richmond have followed North Melbourne's and other clubs tried one or two, three. We recruited 20. So I'm very proud of that. And it, and it was from Lionel Rose, was it? The Lionel Rose story? Because I know that at the oh, time... Oh, Goolagong. Yep, Goolagong. I know at the time of Lionel Rose... I think, I, I think Lionel Rose... Yeah, well, at the time of Lionel Rose, there was another great boxer called Famishan, but just remember Rose, Goolagong. And we're watching Wimbledon... And everybody's hoping, hoping that Gulagon could win. And it's incredible that the two girls have played are both Australians, Anglo-Saxon and Indigenous. And they live to about two hours apart, Barrowan and Aubrey. And here they are at Wimbledon, centre court. And uh, what a magnificent story of Australian sporting history that is. And I still don't think we understood that story. Right yeah. now, even, until I put it in this book. Yeah. And so um, I just want to go back to Lionel Rose for a moment, because at the same time, uh, sure. he was not picked in the Olympic team. Um, bit of a battle Olympics, with administration. Correct. Yeah. And at the same time, also, Indigenous Australia was saying to the government of the country, we think we are people, along with every other Australian, and we think we should be counted in the census. And that was a really significant moment in our history, wasn't it? Because white Australia voted with Indigenous people for that very thing to happen. They, they dragged the politicians to that point. Well, they had to be dragged. They had to go and drag them. I mean, let's face it, a lot of early Australians really struggle with building Australia. 
and finding out what they really wanted to do and you got everything at their feet. They got beautiful people here that didn't have um, an Anglo-Saxon Irish cult background. Uh, we had many people coming uh, more so after the war years coming out to Australia. We had prisoners of war here in Australia and of course the one people that knew the land more than anybody are Indigenous people. And here we have bushfires all over the country. Maybe we should be looking at them for the more experienced knowledge that they have than possibly not doing anything with these people at all. And they know the land better than anyone. I know that uh, you haven't mentioned many sports administrators in these book of uh, Australian icons. <laughs> I want to talk about administration because many champions have gone on to become sports administrators, but there always seems to have been that tension um, in, in our sporting history. Can you talk to me a little bit about the female jockey, Michelle Payne, who became the first one to win a Melbourne Cup and her own wrestle, her own battle with trying to prove people wrong and how significant her story has become? Well, it was a marvellous interview. We held it at Ballarat at a friend's of mine's home, uh, John and Robin Gilbert, out at a place called Brown Hill. And, um, and they've become very good friends now because Robin and John's garden's beautiful. And that was a perfect place in, in a, a piece of nature to just settle a champion like uh, Michelle uh, Payne into a feeling fairly easy to be interviewed and um, and for her effort uh, from losing her mother at such a very young age it's just incredible and of course when you interview the person um, I mean it just flowed uh, because she's a very giving young person she's done so well uh, on the racing carnival just recently with the talent that she has and she'll go on to bigger and better things that young lady will um, but you know to ride and force men to give her a chance to have to live with male jockeys and saunas and you know nothing there to get chained in for women hardly much at all I mean 50% of the population and of course um, uh, these trailblazers have been fantastic and uh, there were a couple there before her obviously but I think when uh, Michelle won the Melbourne Cup uh, I think she let everybody know that um, just don't forget how talented women are. And, of course, many of them have now really come on in the last half a decade since Michelle had won it. And uh, To me, the thing I learned about Michelle was uh, her never, ever say die spirit. And the horse in itself, I had no idea the horse was operated on that year and many parts of its inside were on the table getting better and then put back together and the horse wins the Melbourne Cup that year. That's incredible. Mm. Absolutely incredible. Can we go back to your childhood? Because, you know, these are the formative years and I wonder how often you sit in your garden now and you think back to then, what Australia was then. What is it you think that made you choose Aussie rules football what is it that inspired you to always be looking elsewhere for solutions to problems even before they arose? Well, I think that um, the Botanic Gardens was my favourite place when I was in Paran and South Yarra area when it was a very, very poor area in some areas. Um, we had seven children, a mum and dad, and a very small house. That's nine people. So I always wanted a garden, so I bought an acre and here it is now. So that taught me, you know, one day if you ever get a chance, go and build your own garden and make it similar to what you always love. That's the botanic gardens. Uh, the people I met were fantastic. You know, they, and there was not a lot of money in Australia. No one, no one forget about two car families. We never had television. Uh, we had radio. And um, if you ever thought you could have a transistor, you're a very wealthy young kid. So all of these sorts of things happen, obviously. I reckon that the thing I loved about our young country at that time was the MCG. And the other thing was the Olympic Games in 1956 was an inspiration for our country to get that from mainly Europe and other Pacific nations because I think they must have wanted a long way away from war-torn nations of the world. I don't know how they made that decision because they had to make it obviously, generally they make it eight years ahead. 
So we're talking sort of basically, I'd say about 1947, 48. And that's when I'm born. So, you know, I try and look back on making decisions like that. How do you think that far ahead? And um, so these are the sorts of things I grew up with. I had beautiful parents and fantastic friends and the paper boy rounds I had. I got to meet Australia, walking the streets, catching trams and trains, selling newspapers. So I couldn't do it any better. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> and also, we've seen significant changes in sport, haven't we? Uh, the move from amateur sport to professional sport, with that comes a whole lot of other problems. Um, there's, there's doping issues. Uh, we can move through to the role of the gambling industry and its impact on sport. How do you look at all of those sorts of things? And, and when you pivot forward, what do you think about the future of sport, in, not just in this country, but globally? Well, I think you just got to, you know, have your guidelines and keep, to keep everybody honest. There's a, a hell of a lot of security people out there, which is what we should have, and um, particularly in the gambling side of it, which is quite incredible. Where people in uh, the subcontinent want to gamble on teams in secondary competitions in Australian sport, well, I find that quite incredible. But apparently, that's what does happen. Uh, racing's always had gambling, so and we uh, 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 love. A country that loves racing, and uh, and I do too. Um, I enjoy the horse. I, I breed horses, which is fantastic. I mean, I part own the Sire Black Caviar, which is a huge, uh, you know, plus to have any be anywhere near uh, that with our stay in Ballast Brie. And he won eight stands of the year, I think, in Victoria's history, probably nearly the best stay in. So I love the horse side of it. Love um, uh, the going from professional to. Uh, from amateur to professional was uh, very difficult. Now, the reason I chose football quite simply was that they picked uh, 14 people in the teams my height. So there were 12 teams in Melbourne, and the 12 14s, 168. And um, the other sport I loved was cricket, and I was a leg spinner, and I only picked one. So I found that very difficult, so I thought I'd go with the odds, 168 versus one, and uh, pay dividends. So that was a mathematical thing for me. Uh, I think uh, in general, going from uh, amateur to semi and building into when Channel uh, 9 and Channel 10 put the money on the table, uh, the play had become full-time then, and then we had to go and find full-time coaches. And when that happened, Neil Danaher and I basically started the AFL Coaches Association because we thought that the coaching uh, department of all clubs combined was going to get left behind. And... Uh, that was so important that we started that coaches association and uh, to protect the assistant coaches when the head coaches get sacked. So all of these different changes, along with <clears throat> what was called zoning, where you can only pick a player out of a zone, and then we moved into drafting, which is the American-style draft, uh, you had to be very flexible. See, no coach in the AFL has ever, ever had their best team ever because you're not allowed to. The easiest thing in the world would be to pick a test team. You pick anybody in Australia. Well, in AFL coaching, you can't do that. You have it every now, I think it's every 18th turn, plus a father-son every now and then. Very difficult. We meet a, a lot in sport and in life on milestones. And I suppose in sport, you know, there was a time when people were debating whether mankind could ever break the 10 minute barrier for the 100 meters well now you're not in a 100 meter final unless you do um but back in your day 10 second barrier 10 seconds 10 second barrier yeah i'm thinking back in your day um it was about the four minute mile wasn't it and one of the people yes. that really yep. inspired you was the first australian to break that john landy who has also played mm. a really significant yeah. role in this country well he did and uh, not only that, he ended up Governor of Victoria, which I thought was a fantastic appointment. Um, John Landy, absolutely, he's, he's a class person. Uh, for him to go back and pick up Ron Clark after accidentally tripping each other, uh, and then went on to win, to win the race. And, um, you know, like these events, sometimes they're only very short. You know, a game of, a game of football is two hours, like it's a song and dance show. It's like going to a dance, you know. It's all over. You win or you lose, you know and um, get on with the next game. That's the way I looked at whether you won or you lost. 
and hopefully you learn a hell of a lot out of your losses. And um, so to me, it was, you know, it was a person like Landy was a class performance because he cared about his opponents. Now, I'm not saying I did. My opponents were the enemy. So there's a little bit of ugliness there in my side when I played, but um, probably a much better person as a coach. And if somebody said to you, Kevin Sheedy, you're allowed to come back and live a whole life again, what kind of life would that be? What sport would you choose? What kind of person would you look to be? How different would it be to the Kevin Sheedy that's experienced this life? Wow. Gee, that's a big question or two. No, look, I, I'd, um, I would still, I still love the game of footy. I still think it's a magnificent sport. Uh, I think it's the greatest game in the world, like as a style of game. It has to be channeled every now and then because the coaches muck it up. Um, and I'm glad they brought 666 back in because that allowed a free flow to goal rather than everybody stacking the back line after every goal. So that's negated the game a lot. Um, I love the other codes, but I think the codes are very good. I mean, we're, we're the only country in the world that's got four football codes. And I don't think other, other countries understand that. that we're very open-minded to most anything we want to trial. And uh, I think our soccer, our rugby and our rugby league, uh, great. Let them ha- I believe in that because it does suit certain styles of individuals' bodies and builds to have a go at that sport. I mean, in, in our game, we, we love those tall, lean players. And, and in rugby league, they love those real power plays because it's a power game. Uh, we love a little bit more athletic because we, we play 40 minutes longer than um, rugby league and 30 minutes longer than soccer. So it's a balance off between the style of athlete we look at. No, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the game that I played, and, AFL. And the person you are? Well, I, I think I'm handling it okay, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm okay. You know, like, I, I don't want to be any more than what I am. I, I, money's okay. Too much is ridiculous for the wealthy people. I just think that, you know, to me, if you've got a lot of money out there, the billionaires, the multi-millionaires, just give some back to the people that don't have any somehow. Work it out. Kevin Sheedy, wonderful talking to you. Thank you for your time. Tracy, thank you. And thank you for watching. I'm Tracy Holmes. See you next time.